I got you. Okay. All right, my man. How's it going? Well, <laughs> it's been crazy, Jeff. With this new record coming out, man, I, 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 I'd be lying if I didn't say, you know, um, I'm just trying to fix this here. Here, is that okay? That's perfect. Okay. I'm just exactly. trying, you know. You're, you're like all my these days and working hard and you know just always working. How, how is it going? Well, you know, I wish I was always working, but you know, since the pandemic, you know, everything's been pushed back, pushed back, pushed back, pushed back. And so, you know, I'm doing some of the gigs that we're making up from last year, right. but the tour is like going to Poland and Spain, they're gone, you know, okay. they're trying so to put you in next year. So like, basically you're working on what was supposed to be. And it's like, everything's just domino. Like it's we're going on another, another exactly. show and then like just working on postpones. Yeah. And, and you know, it, it's funny. Things are falling. Things are, are falling into my lap that wouldn't have never happened. Like I just, I did seven days. I just did seven dates with Thoroughgood, you know, open up for George, which wouldn't have fallen in my lap, you know, unless like just the way you ran it down. Well, that worked out good. Yeah. Hey, it's fun too. Where did you find a title like Eclectic Electric? Because that's like a tongue twister almost for, for your album. <laughs> well, I, I look, I, I never try to name a record before it's finished. I, I sort of let it sort of try to like water seek its own level. And the thing about this record is that it's very eclectic and it's very electric. Even though there's one acoustic song on there, there's a lot of, lot of guitar, you know, playing on there and different things. So it sort of fit, you know, it's natural. You know, for writing and, and finding inspiration, you know, what what do you go to for inspiration? And, you know, certainly for writing the songs and, and picking out covers, let's say, to, to play on this and just the whole thing for, you know, recording, let's say. Well, a lot of some of these songs I had written a long time ago, the songs that made it on the record, some songs were sent to me. Uh, a couple of songs were by friends of mine. Okay. And I asked them, I'd asked them if I could do the song. Um, Werewolves of London, a friend of mine, Wadi Wattel, wrote that song. And so Wadi was kind enough to play slide on this here version that you heard. Okay. Slide, Wadi's playing slide, I'm playing regular guitar. Um, for Hotel California, I, I asked friends of mine, different people, producers I work with, you know, what would you guys hear me doing? This is my 30th album. You know, and they said, well, you know, we like when you did um, Why My Guitar Jenny Leaks, Weeks. We like your version of Heart of Stone. You know, all those records, that songs that were on compilation albums. We, we like your version of uh, You Need Love. You know, we like your version. So I said, okay, well, what songs do you hear me? You know, if I'm a new cover song. Which, well, when, 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 when uh, Werewolves came up, it was a no-brainer for me because of Wadi. You know, he's like my brother from another mother. So when I when I played it for Wadi, I said, man, we funked it up. And Wadi was like, hey, this is the way I really wanted it to be done, Joe. I mean, so let me put the loud on it. So he put the slide on it, the loud. Um, uh, Kochmore would have played on uh, All She Wants to Do Is Dance. Danny wrote the song with, uh, I think, Glenn Fry, Don Henley. And, but but his group, immediate family, they were busy. They, all of a sudden, him and Wadi and... And, 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 and Russ Kunkel, they all got busy. So, but you know, it's my friend, so I know that song. Um, uh, the Eagles song was the outlier. I wanted to pick a song that is an iconic song that I could totally do my own way. Right. And um, I did it with um, G.E. Smith and uh, T-Bone Walk, Rest His Soul. And when they sent me um, a, While My Guitar Gently Weeps, we made it like a slow blues. And, you know, I mean, it got so many hits that, you know, I, when somebody came up and says, well, why don't you try one of these iconic songs like Hotel California? I said, well, why should I try something like Hotel California? Why don't I just don't do Hotel California? And I'll do it sort of reggae, bluesy, funky, you know, a little bit different. And so I, I hope that, you know, the guys, Joe Walsh and him like it. Um, the, the other outlier is that, Another song that was a friend of mine let me do was Make No Mistake. You know, um, 
uh, I I had I had asked uh, Keith. I, I said, you know, can I do this song, man? Because I, you know, I like this song. And so Keith told me, he said, you know, Joe, just make it yours, man. Just make it yours. And so I did, you know, and I ain't heard nothing bad back from him. And I know he didn't hurt. <laughs> so, <laughs> so far, so good, you know. <laughs> and that's what, you know, that's why I really, I like to pick covers with, I, I somewhat know the people a little bit, but I also like to pick something that people would say, what the heck's that blues guy doing it? And then I can always come back and say, you know, before I was a blues guy, blues musician, I was just a musician, you know? So when you get John Lennon walking in a room with Marvin Gaye, with Bob Marley, with Chuck Berry, with Les Paul, with Django Reinhardt, Django doesn't walk in and say, hey, I'm Django, the gypsy guitar player. Keith don't walk and say, I'm Keith the rock and roll. Everybody just walks in and say, hey, man, I'm so-and-so, I'm a guitar player. And invariably, if they're going to play a song, everybody's going to tune up and they're going to go, okay, one, two, three. You're rock, rock, rock. They're not going to play Box Fugue number 68. They're not going to play Fly Me to the Moon. They're not going to play She Loves You. They're not going to play Satisfaction. They're going to play a rock and roll song. It's the nature of the beast, you know? So I figured if I could capture that sort of spirit, you know what I mean, Jeff? I'm all right. You know, and that's the way I look at music. You know, I don't look at myself as uh, this type of guitar player or that type of guitar player or this guy or that guy or this guy. That. I just look at myself as a musician. You know, although I'm known for blues and blues is my mother tongue. Uh, I tell everybody, you know, I've played with everybody from B.B. King to Ronnie Wood to Herbie Hancock, Wayne Shorter, Ramsey Lewis, David Sanborn to Scotty Moore, DJ Fontana, to you name it, because I'm a musician and I like, I like playing different things. You know, it's like when I used to eat meat, but I'm a vegan, I used to say I like, I like to eat chicken, but not seven days a week. Well, I like blues, but I'm not force fed blues seven days a week. You know, I do like, you know, I like the expensive winos. You know, I, I, I like uh, uh, Kochmore or some of this stuff. I, I love Nick Lowe. You know, I, I love Bobby Weir, my homeboy from San Francisco. You know, just as much as I love Muddy Waters, Gary Clark Jr., you know, uh, 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 Robert Cray, Stevie Ray, I like them all, you know. Just a man of music, you know. That's a, the that's a song, man. I got to remember that. A man of music. Yeah. A man of music. That's a good one, Jeff. It is. And, you know, when you look at it, we're all in music. So yeah, we we, we have to look at it. You know, people say, oh, you got to play the blues and all that stuff. It's like, oh, I'm just going to play whatever I feel like today. And, you know, maybe tomorrow going another route and then the blues on Friday. Yeah. And, and if you notice all the records that we ended up loving, whether they're iconic guys from the iconic my generation or a little bit before the 60s, you notice that every all those artists, they they might, oh man, we had such a big hit with my generation. Well, let's write a rock opera now. <laughs> so everybody is expecting no 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 people. No, no, it's not that now. It's something totally nobody even knew this guy had it in him. Yeah. Now it's a whole thing that he's had in his mind all that time. And it worked. So instead of Marvin Gaye singing, can I get a witness? Oh, give me another can I get a witness? No, man. No. Mother, mother. A whole album of it. Ecology song. Mother, who's <laughs> Motown's supposed to be about my girl, my girl. And he's right. doing an ecology. <laughs> so, you know, you can't stop good music, man. And you can't stop somebody wanting to be a more rounded person and musician i think that's that's what gets that's what i like you know and joe let's say for the artwork of this you know masterpiece you re released the artwork is, it sells itself right there i mean <laughs> it's just pretty uh, epic i would say well you you got me because i'll be quite honest i'm colorblind so I, I i couldn't tell you what blue from chartreuse i could not tell you red from orange 
So when it came to the album cover, all I see is a figure of a guy holding a guitar with lightning coming out of its butt. I don't, <laughs> I don't know, Jeff. <laughs> you know, I'm glad you like it. <laughs> well, uh, today it's like the book sells the sells the album. You know, the the cover. You yeah, know? And, yeah. And, and so sometimes people do go for that. You know, oh, it's cool. The album, the music's gotta be cool too. So yeah, yeah. Hopefully, hopefully it is. And in this case, it is. So it, yeah. Well, thank you. You know, working it, recording it. You know, and getting mixed and mastered. Did you spend a lot of time to get the sound quality as you wanted it? Uh, right now, I, I think with the advent of technology, you you, you really got to work hard to screw up the sound. They have so many things now that can give you, give you good sound. You know, um, I, I, I think it's, in a way, it's good. And in a way, it may be not so good. Because I think what happened in, in, in the 60s with a lot of experimentation, devil tracking, um, uh, uh, putting backwards solos, backwards drums, back. You know, for the people to get to the to to get to to be able to do those things because they were considered impossible at the time. Yeah, they had to go through hours of sitting in the studio. So when you have someone like John Lennon walking in and telling George Martin, "I had a dream last night. I want the drums to go backwards," you know, and and looking at Ringo and Ringo thinking, "What well, you want me to play backwards?" Like literally, no, I want the drums. To what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Well, I, I went to sleep and, 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 and the tape was all over the room and I just taped it together and I heard this song. Mm, 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 relax yourself and roll downstream. Doom, bat, doom, ba -da, doom, bat, doom, is it not dying? And then I heard these, I, then I, I heard these, these birds go, whoa, 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 whoa. Then, put the guitar in there. Does that sound like a guitar? No, John, that's not a guitar. It is to me. I <laughs> like that. Tomorrow, Because tomorrow never knows. Put it down there. It had never got done. If you're if you're today, it would have never got done. Because right. they would have said, "Well, you know, I'm pushing the backwards button on the on the thing here, and uh, you know what I'm getting is uh, I'm, I'm getting the um, uh, I'm, I'm getting the uh, thing back from tomorrow never knows. Uh, are you experienced? I'm getting all that, and I don't, I don't know what do you. It had never happened, you know, because people would not have been. Um, to, to find something as creative as that, nine times out of 10, it comes from a mistake. Mm -hmm. Nine times out of 10. So what John Lennon heard in his head, it was a mistake. Literally, it was tape flowing all around his room. And, and it, he just heard it backwards. But the guy's dyslexic anyway. So what you got when you get a John Lennon song, you get, you know, you <laughs> when they say flip side of a, of, of a record, you really get the flip side. <laughs> So you get this beautiful melody. Oh, great. Turn it over. Is this the same group? Is, it, is this strawberry? One bar. Then the little baby voice. You know, I mean, <laughs> Lennon was all over the place. Him and Jimi Hendrix all over the place with the studio. They use the studio like another member of the band. Mm -hmm. And I know I've recorded at the BBC studios in the 80s. You know, I mean, giant ceilings, giant, the old faders, literally everything. When they walked in the studio, the number one thing was, okay, lads, you can do anything you want. Don't touch any dials. Can you imagine that? So the, what did Ringo say? The biggest thrill of our life, was after four or five million trillion records sold, we could touch a dial. Well, can you imagine telling John Lennon you could touch the dial now? What did Keith do? <laughs> so I can touch the dial now? Yeah. Don't put it in the red. I want everything in the red. <laughs> everything. <laughs> and the technician standing there with their white jackets like, oh my God, the inmates are taking over the asylum. Another million seller, another million seller, another million seller. <laughs> No yeah. more white suits. No more white suits. <laughs> you got to love it, man. So you basically, really John Lennon's the guy that invented or got the first vision for backing backwards recordings. 
I, I think he was the one of the first ones to really tomorrow never knows. And no, I'm only sleeping. You know, I'm only sleeping. It, it has a quick guitar solo, but I think I'm only sleeping came tomorrow never knows came. I think I'm only sleeping came after tomorrow never knows. I don't know which one, but uh, yeah, Lennon was the one. Well, McCartney too, actually. You know, because McCartney was deep into electronic music and he was deep in avant-garde stuff. Okay. So I don't know if they were the first ones, but they were the first ones of that stature that really put those out there. And then, of course, the other one was Jimmy, you yeah. know, with 67 with with, uh, with um, uh, uh, Are You Experienced? Yeah. You know? Yeah. You know, Are You Experienced is an interesting song, you know, which was like a single and it's backwards. So it, right there, it's it's, it's, it is pretty crazy that you can listen to the radio and, and hear a backward song. You know, it, <laughs> it, it is pretty uh, avant-garde in that way. When you think of 1967? Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and you know, that if, if you don't have an engineer or a producer that's willing to stay up three or four or five or six hours, you know, saying, hey, man, I, I don't know what you're talking about but you hear it in your head. And so we're going to try to get what you hear in your head, although you can't articulate it. And even if you could, you're dyslexic anyway. So I wouldn't understand it unless I did it backwards. So I don't even know what to do. He's, well, I'll know it when I hear it. Yeah. I'll know it when I hear it. And, you know, I've been in studios where producers like, well, you know, uh, you got, hey, man, you no, know, don't, don't look at your clock. Okay. Cause you're not playing for this session. I'm paying for this session. You know, in fact, you know, <laughs> it's the Elvis Presley thing. What he told, uh, what, what he told uh, 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 the guitar player who produced him, Atkins, Chet Atkins. First time Elvis went to uh, Nashville. Yeah. When when Sam Phillips sold his contract, Scotty Moore say, uh, first day Elvis was down there, he gets a call, eleven o'clock, uh, Scotty. I don't know anything about anything down here. He says, Mr. Atkins is bringing fiddle players in. I never met violin players. There's female singers. There's all kinds of people. I don't know. I went to eat some breakfast and some food and came back and they were all singing on my song. I don't know what they're doing. He's in there. And Scotty said, well, you know, that was Mr. Atkins is going to try to do his best for you. He says, but Scotty, when we played, made records like Hound Dog, we were all in one room. He says, this room's so big, there's, it seems like there's a whole bunch of people from the, the symphony and stuff. I don't know these people. I feel, he says, Elvis, just formulate your words. Tell Mr. Atkins your problems, what your fears are, and call me back after, you know, you guys have had a conversation. Five, four minutes later, Elvis calls him. <laughs> Scotty says, well, Elvis, what happened? He says, well, Scotty, I said, Mr. Atkins, may I have a word with you? And he said, yeah. He says, well, Mr. Atkins, your services are no longer needed. Go call Scotty and everybody and have them come to Nashville. That's what they did. <laughs> your services are no longer needed. They got together again, but, you know, that's, you know, that's the wheelhouse that you got to get into. You got to make it so things are comfortable for you to create. You know, the thing that made Elvis Presley so famous was not only Elvis. It was a group called the Blue Moon Boys. Who were Scotty Moore, DJ Fontana, and Bill Black. They were already a band. They were just looking for a white guy who could sound black. Like that's what Sam Phillips said, not me. Sam Phillips said, I need a white guy who can sound black. I'm recording Holland Wolf, BB King, Ike Turner, and they're selling a little bit. But if I can find a white guy to sing like this, we, we, we're we at home. And he did. But Elvis was a prefabricated guy. He already was singing like that. Mm -hmm. So it was a it was a match. It was a match. And only in America can you get that just position anyway. You know, only in America can you get you can get all that, you know, that kind of a mixture. Uh, it couldn't happen in France. France couldn't invent rock and roll. No disrespect. You know, uh, it, it, it had to be America. Right. Because you, know, you have so many different diverse backgrounds coming together and playing together, living together, loving together. Even though people, some people didn't like it, it was happening and creating together. And to me, when you get that mixture, you get the best of all worlds. You know, you get the tempered scale of Western music. 
you get the uh, African drumming rhythm, like Bob Marley called it rhythm. And, and you get the spontaneity of, 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 of like singing like we do. You get the, 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 um, the control of singing like opera. When you put all that together, you get Aretha Franklin. <laughs> you know, you get gospel. She sings ospo, uh, opera, gospel, funk, jazz, rock and roll, whatever you name. But one thing about it, most of those, all those musics were made famous in America. You know, it, it's, it's really weird. It, it's really a strange thing. It, and I think it comes out of all the ups and downs the 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 dichotomies of America, the 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 good, the bad, and the ugly, and and people finding a way to navigate all that, you know, finding a way to navigate it was it, it, for the older guys was was really rough, you know, for all for those that were really putting all that stuff together, it was no easy easy uh, task. You know? Joe, let's go back, you know, with Elvis. You think it's by chance, right place, right time, he made it, you know, that let's say he was not in the right territory at the time. What would have happened to rock and roll? Well, we, well, there's two questions. We were, black people were already playing rock and roll. Louis Jordan made a rock and roll record in 48. Um, they had, the, the, uh, Ike Turner made the first rock and roll record called Rocket 88, hmm. uh, I don't know, 55 or something, on the, on the Sun label. He was on Sam Phillips' label. B.B. Um, King was already on Sam Phillips' label, three o'clock in the morning blues, million seller. Rocket 88, million seller. Um, Mystery Train, the original Mystery Train, Lil' Junior Parker and the Blue Flames, on Sun Records. All they did was find that guy that Sam was looking for. But that guy was not, he, he wasn't the monkeys, you know. He, he didn't answer an ad in the paper for a group that looked like the Beatles. Elvis was already that person. Mm. He was already that guy. So when he came in the sun, it was a match made in heaven, you know. And, and to show you that Elvis was already there, I mean, I got pictures of Elvis Presley and B.B. King together. I got pictures of Elvis Presley and Lil' Junior Parker together. I got pictures of Elvis Presley and Bobby Blue Bland together. I got pictures of Elvis Presley and Mahalia Jackson, Elvis Presley and the Clara Ward singers, Elvis Presley and Jackie Wilson, Elvis Presley and Roy Hamilton, Elvis Presley and El Lord, let's, uh, Elvis Presley and Muhammad Ali. Elvis Presley was around more black people than I was. Okay? Wow. And when he got famous, he never shied away from it. He was still friends with Sammy Davis Jr., with, with the Supremes. His backing vocal group was Whitney Houston's mother. Okay. So Elvis was very comfortable in the culture that I come out of because he lived in the projects. <laughs> you call them council houses in England. He lived in the projects. We're black people over there and him right here. Dirt Poe. He listened to black music. He listened to black church. And so for Elvis, it really wasn't a thing of black and white so much as it was a thing of what he was comfortable doing. And like Scotty Moore told me, he said, Joe, we didn't, we love country, real hard country western, but we didn't want to play it. Scotty said, me and Roy Perkins, me, me, me and uh, 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 Carl Perkins, we didn't want to be Hank Williams. We didn't want to be uh, 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 Ralph Stanley and the Clinch Mountain Boys. We wanted to be blues guys, but we couldn't play the blues any better than the guys that were already in some studios. So mm. what did we do? We invented a cross in between the both. And they put a name on it called Rockabilly. Mm -hmm. On the other flip of that coin, you had a, a black guy in St. Louis wanting to play country western. Wrote a song called Ida Red. Oh, Ida Red. Why can't you be too chick? Face wasn't on the cover of the record. Country clubs wanted him. First country club he went to, I'm the guy from Ida Red. You, you that guy, Chuck Berry? Yeah. Well, um, I don't think you want to play in this club. Oh, yeah, I, I love country music. No, you don't want to play. So Chuck Berry couldn't play in those clubs. So what did he do? Chuck Berry, in every song he wrote, put the word rock and roll in it. Okay. In every song Elvis Presley never wrote because he never wrote a song. So how could he put <laughs> rock and roll in a song? In right. fact, 
Chuck Berry has a unique position that everybody from the Beatles to Elvis Presley did his music. You never seen Chuck Berry do a Beatles song. You never seen Chuck Berry do an Elvis Presley song, have you? True. Have you? That, that tells you right there who invented rock and roll. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, with, without Chuck, without Elvis, the masses of people would not have been hip to people like Little Richard and Chuck Berry, maybe. Mm. But on the same token, when the Beatles and the Stones came over, they reintroduced those guys all over again. The Stones reintroduced introduced all the blues to, to most of some of America. It was already in my house, my cousin's house. We listened to Howling Love, Wolf. We listened to Sonny Boy Wilson. You better, because my father did. So that's what I learned as a six, seven year old who those guys were. I didn't need the Rolling Stones to tell me, but I was glad they did come over in the Yardbirds, did come over and bring, because they lifted it up, you know? So Joe here, we only got two minutes left with the Skype, with this uh, Zoom interview because of the time. Um, very lovely chat, man, because your knowledge is like an encyclopedia in music. Well, I've been fortunate. I've been around some of those older guys. When I'm around them, I, I open my ears, you know? I yeah. listen. I uh, love your yeah. stories. It's um, very good. Um, this album of yours is going to sound great, and hopefully <laughs> it does wonders on the internet because that's what we are with today. <laughs> internet. You know, it's a whole different world. You ain't lying, Jeff. And I want to tell you, I appreciate you, you know, um, having me and, and, you know, being so gracious and everything, you know, um, and, and being, uh, you know, cool about everything and and i uh, hope to do this again man sometime man absolutely and uh yeah this is our second time we we do interviews i do believe and uh we'll do another one yeah. in, uh, not too far in the future beautiful all right man you have a great evening you take care of yourself brother okay see you che cheers cheers <laughs>